wonderful to see you again, Dr. Carmichael. Uh, very interesting. I've been seeing this trend on social media about narcissistic personality disorder, uh, toxic you, is used a lot, toxic individuals. Um, but you just participated as an expert voice in a Newsweek article all about pathological liars, um, which is obviously its own kind of disorder. What exactly is a pathological liar other than just what you would think is someone who cannot tell the truth? <laughs> yes, that's an interesting question. So as you said, obviously it's somebody who tends to lie quite a lot. Though when we get into the realm of a pathological liar, and I do think it's an important distinction because honestly, of course, we all lie, right? If anybody says, hey, I've never told a lie, I mean, that's that's probably a lie <laughs> in and of itself. But when it comes to a pathological liar, this would be somebody who is lying sometimes like over things without without remorse, right? Things that they know are really going to cause serious harm or damage to another person, right? Like somebody who's maybe married, but they're carrying on with another woman, making her think that she's investing in a relationship that could lead to marriage, right? The mm -hmm. other side of the pathological liar is somebody who lies for no reason, right? Somebody who just lies, again, seemingly for no reason. Now, as a psychologist, of course, I can think about other reasons, like maybe maybe they're afraid to be vulnerable. They don't want people to know the real them. And so all these lies are a smoke screen, or sometimes it's a power play to lie just for the thrill of it. But hmm. patho pathological liars are definitely um, a, a difficult beast for sure. What are some of the symptoms or signs of a pathological liar? Because I would think it would take a, a pattern, right? You can't just, you maybe meet someone for coffee, let's say if you're dating someone and they seem great, they're charismatic, they're engaging, they seem to have their stuff together. And then you go out with them again. And then maybe they told you something like, oh, I own a boat. And then the second time you go out with them, they say, well, my friend owns the boat, not really me. Is there a way to kind of start discerning who could be a pathological liar versus who's not? Sure, Diana. So one thing that you honed in on there very quickly, of course, is do their stories seem to be consistent and accurate over time? Or do you get the sense, you know, that they're playing kind of fast and loose with the truth and that some of the things that they say have a little bit of an embellishment or a little bit of a gloss on them? One of the other things that you mentioned there, Diana, is the word charismatic, right? Um, and unfortunately, many pathological liars will lie in order to make themselves seem more interesting or in order to manipulate you to really grab your interest and, and for some reason, you know, make themselves seem desirable to you. And so unfortunately, that means sometimes they'll tell you what you want to hear, right? I mean, let's be honest, you're on a first date. It's not the worst thing in the world to, to hear that somebody owns a boat and that they have a great life and all these things, right? So sometimes that pathological liar is in a very strategic manner telling you exactly what you want to hear. And it can therefore be very difficult to come back down to earth and realize, wait a minute, this isn't Mr. Amazing. This is actually Mr. I'm trying not to curse right now, uh, but you know, some other name for that person. Oh, so is there anything that you would say would be like a top red flag for being able to distinguish who could be this type of personality. And would you say um, just briefly that a, a pathological liar in the DSM-5, the diet uh, for those that don't know, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual um, that does a breakdown of all psychological uh, disorders, um, would a pathological liar be a personality disorder or would it be a subset of a larger personality disorder? That is a really interesting question. I'm honestly not 100% sure of that question. Um, I would certainly say that pathological lying is a part of 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 many <laughs> disorders, right? right. So <laughs> for example, uh, say an alcoholic or a substance abuser will oftentimes become a pathological liar as they're trying to cover up for all of their other issues or somebody with a personality disorder could also be 
prone to, you know, making things up. So um, th that's, a, that's an interesting question. But as for your other question about, you know, what are some of the red flags to look for? I would say, you know, the obvious, but things that don't add up, stories that don't add up. Somebody who, you know, the old um, adage that you want somebody who who does what he says he's going to do and he shows up where he says he's going to be and that there's this consistency. If you're spotting inconsistencies, especially in the first few times that you've met somebody, I would say that that's a big red flag, right? Because again, you know, we've all had times where we kind of didn't handle a situation the way we should. And maybe we in, in, in the moment just blurted something out and we were like, oh, I can't believe I said that or whatever. And, and it comes back to haunt you later. Um, but if it's happening in the early stages with somebody, that's certainly not a good sign. Um, and if it happens repeatedly with somebody, again, I mean, I'm a psychologist, so I'm pretty empathetic. I like to give people a certain amount of grace. But if you catch somebody in, you know, more than one lie, um, I, I would say that would start to become a red flag, especially if it's in the very early stages of just getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Is, are there stories of people who, let's say, marry a pathological liar, they didn't notice the red flags, everything seemed to add up. And then as they're in a long-term relationship, these indiscrepancies start appearing more and more and more. I mean, is there, I guess there's always an exception to every single rule and how you can be easily hoodwinked by someone if they've been a manipulator for their entire lives. Yeah, definitely. I think it also depends on how long you knew the person before you decided to get married and how deep the relationship went with that person before you decided to get married, as well as how confident and assertive you are and how much kind of due diligence, you know, you do yourself on a person. There is, again, always the factor that we tend to believe what we want to believe. So if, if, if somebody's selling you a bill of goods or, you know, singing a song that you want to hear yeah. and you ignore some little part of yourself that says, I wonder if this is too good to be true, and you don't really ask those follow-up questions or you don't really let yourself put two and two together, you, you can allow yourself to be led down a garden path. Now, I don't want to therefore seem as if I'm implying that it's always the victim's fault, not at all. But on the other hand, if you get down to the level, as you said, of actually walking down the aisle with somebody, um, I would say it's probably a pretty rare case. It would have to be a pretty masterful pathological liar that could actually get you all the way down the aisle before you realized it. Now, there is something different, however, which is, on the other hand, some people, once they're married, will feel like, okay, I've got you now. Mm -hmm. Now I can step out and have an, an affair. I can start doing behaviors that I wouldn't have done before because you won't leave me now because you're hooked to me. Uh. That's a little bit more like a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> you know, than, than a pathological liar. So um, I, I hate to say it, but there's, there's all kinds of different ways that I we have, do have to guard ourselves in relationships. I have heard multiple stories from um, over the years of friends of friends, uh, someone I knew, you know, through, through mutual friends, um, dated someone for five years and he was wonderful. The family adored him. Everybody thought he was great. They had a lavish wedding while they were on their honeymoon, it was the first time he became physically abusive. And part of that terminology that he used to her was, we're married now, you can't go anywhere. So it was very, um, very quick. There's also statistics that go with pregnancy and abuse, um, that women are more likely to be abused while they're pregnant because they're more vulnerable by, like you said, someone who might be deemed a sociopath. So it's like you said, there's always a, the possibility that you could do all of your due diligence and still find yourself in a hor horrible, horrible situation. Sad to say, yeah, unfortunately, there's no guarantees in life. 
Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now we've been talking about pathological lying on the sound, the side of um, interpersonal romantic uh, marriage constructs, relationship constructs. But what about if you have a colleague who is a pathological liar and let's say they embellish to your supervisor, they take credit for your work. How do you navigate that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So it's, it's really, as you're describing it, it's somewhat about a pathological liar kind of combined with narcissism, right? Going back to our earlier discussion about how a, a lot of times the lies are geared around inflating the self, the, the liar's you know, sense of power or um, sense of one-upmanship um, in relationships. And that can be at the workplace as well. So how do you deal with that? Um, I think that once you spot it, once you realize what's happening, um, you can at least become strategic about it, right? So the only kind of silver lining to having somebody who frequently, repetitively does um, unnerving things is that at least you you know forewarned is forearmed, and so at least you can prepare for it, right? So that way, at least you can start, you know, say once you know you have created a great new concept for a presentation, and you and that person are partnering on, you know, bringing it home and delivering it. You want to make sure that you get the credit for, you know, the original design and idea. Um, maybe you can make sure to send an email to the boss with an update about saying something like. Like, hey, boss, you know, I, I springboarded from that big idea we took at the conference and my partner, Jack, is really into that. And so we're going to work on that one together, looking forward to showing it to you, right? Mm -hmm. So it does mean that you may have to step forward a little bit about making sure that you do take credit for what you've done, because the odds of changing this person at work are probably even lower than the odds of changing someone in your personal life. Well, that's interesting that you, you talked about change. So I have read that narcissistic personality disorder is really almost impossible to cure because only like 1% actually get that NPD diagnosis. And other than that, it's like exhibiting traits of, of extreme narcissism, moderate narcissism, something like that. But for a pathological liar, what is the possibility that they could ever be quote unquote um, treated? That's an interesting question. So as you said, you know, with certain issues like narcissism, the person probably doesn't want to change, right? Because they love themselves just the way they are, right? So uh, we, we really cannot change a person who doesn't want to be changed. And if the pathological lying is really just in service of the narcissism, then as long as it's, you know, in, in that person's mind, helping themselves by getting other people to um, even erroneously you know, kind of worship them or admire them, the person really has no need to change it because it's a tool. On the other hand, I actually have worked with a couple of people that self-identified as pathological liars who on their own accord came to treatment to seek help. Now, I've also worked with people that were pathological liars that came to treatment because their partner said to them, hey, either you change this or I'm going to leave. And in those cases, the person was not really a narcissist. It was actually somebody who was quite insecure about themselves mm -hmm. and who had been using this lying to try to attract or impress people because they felt less than. And so when their partner said to them, you know, I don't care if you're sleeping with like, extra affairs because you feel less than the point mm -hmm. is you better stop it and you better stop lying about it or else you're going to lose me. And the person had kind of a, a come to Jesus moment and was like, wow, this pathological lying really isn't serving me. And so they, they wanted to come to treatment or sometimes I've had a couple of people come where nobody told them to come. It was just that they, they personally felt idiotic and foolish for just constantly blurting out these lies and their own sense of shame prompted them to come in. But in those cases as well, it was really because the liar felt um, a sense of inadequacy and they at least had the self-awareness to realize that they weren't doing themselves any favors 
by just um, by just telling lies. Now, to your question, how do we treat it, right? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of ways. Um, some are very specific and strategic. One is that when you realize that you're that you're telling a lie, you fess up and you own it, right? It has to become a little bit unpleasant for you to lie. Otherwise, you'll keep doing it. And one way to make it a little unpleasant is, is, is to learn how to acknowledge it. And sometimes they also just need some scripts to learn how to do that, right? Um, and so they would prepare the people in their life by saying, hey, look, um, it may or may not be a surprise to you, but I've had a little bit of an issue with honesty. And so from now on, when I realize I'm starting to do it, I'm just going to acknowledge it. Um, and if you wonder if I'm doing it, by all means, please go ahead and say so. And I mean, I've had clients who did this even like they they would make it up that they uh, were carrying, you know, a, a Gucci bag when it was really a fake. And a friend would say, oh, what an amazing bag. And they would say, yeah, I picked it up at Gucci, decided to treat myself. And then they would have to say, you know what? I'm doing it. The truth is this was something I picked up in Chinatown. And <laughs> by just even having practice in session of just role playing it out, normalizing it, learning like, you know what? I actually could do this. I could say, I, I could find the words to say, you know what? I misspoke there, or mm -hmm. you know what? I really wanted to impress you. And so I said something that wasn't true. I feel silly, but but let me tell you the truth, right? And, and that's about the little things. Now, other ways that pathological liars who maybe lie about bigger things, like, you know, say having the stream of affairs and those yeah. types of things, sometimes it helps them to provide a little bit of a natural backstop by giving their partner the code to their phone and the code to their email and everything else. And instead of resenting their partner for quote, you know, checking up on them, to be thankful to their partner, to say, wow, I really appreciate that you and I both know I have this problem with honesty and that you're not walking away from me. In fact, you're willing to stay with me and, and look through what I'm doing because you care about me. And when they can actually make that shift, it can be very powerful. Wow. But that also comes down to, which is a, a whole other topic of conversation that it's almost like having to babysit who's supposed to be your equal. And that's, that's a lot. <laughs> it is. And, and I don't blame people who, who are not up for that, right? Because there's also a point of codependency, which mm -hmm. is where if somebody's dysfunction is so great that they're breaking their own boundaries in life to the point where then everybody else around them has to start breaking their own boundaries as yeah. well. And, you know, you're constantly finding messages from other women in that person's phone. And it's not like your extra set of eyes is just helping to keep them honest. It's more like it's, it's, it's just dragging you down with them. It's yeah. Crazy. You definitely don't always want to do that. And I'm not saying everybody yeah. should always do that, right. but it, it can sometimes be, be a positive. Right. Yeah. No, I, there's always, like you said, there's always exceptions to the rule and nothing is a, is a catch all. And we're talking in very general terms here. The, the final question I have goes back to pathological lying and narcissism, since that's just been such a, a heavy trending topic right now. I have read that the underlying current of narcissism does really come down to not liking themselves, but having to kind of create this false exterior that they've like a mask. There's always a talk about a mask. So is deep down narcissism, just a, an inauthentic persona that the person has come to construct. And then it, they like that persona, but not really who they are, but they don't really know who they are. It's like <laughs> multi-layered. Yeah. You're touching on so many important things because alongside that, there's also kind of a, another sort of pandemic of people that don't have a sense of self, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's kind of a, a, a piggyback issue. But on the topic of narcissism, to your point, some of them, as you said, just do have this sense of emptiness inside and all that narcissism is just puffery to try to cover it up. Some of them really do believe, you know, that they're better than other people and that they kind of hung the moon and everything else. And, and that's just their, their true belief. 
Um, in psychology terms, we break narcissists up into two categories, benign and malignant. So the benign narcissist is actually the person um, who, who really does just kind of really like themselves genuinely, and they're just going to be very self-absorbed and, and that's just who they are. The malignant narcissist tends to actually be the person who feels more empty inside and, and therefore they can be more competitive with other people and they feel like they need to cut other people down in order to make sure that they themselves don't feel too far behind. And that's the kind of person you really want to look out for is somebody who needs to belittle or minimize or lie to you to keep you in a box so that they can feel like they have an edge. Um, does, do both the benign and the malignant, do they both have issues with lying, like cheating? That well, kind of yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, in my experience, the benign narcissist may actually be less likely to lie because they are truly just so fascinated and taken with themselves as they are, right? Mm -hmm. If they lie, it's almost like um, drinking their own Kool-Aid, right? Like they, they might say, oh my goodness, everybody at the party was talking to me. I was the life of the party. It was incredible. Like the sky was following me around. He would not stop. He would not leave me alone. It was almost embarrassing. And I know that, 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 so that might not even really be what happened, but in the person's mind, it's true because they have such a genuinely inflated sense of themselves, mm -hmm. you know, whereas the malignant narcissist might be more compelled to feel like, Hey, that other person seemed to be getting more attention than me. I better come up with a narrative to squash that fast or oh. else my inadequacies are going to be seen. Got it. Yeah, it is. I mean, the tapestry of lying is incredibly intriguing and also really sad at the same time because it comes down to something, some component, something within someone's self where they feel like they're lacking. Um, and that takes a lot of work to fix. And thankfully, there are people like you who are willing to help those people who are who want the help to get it. Um, so thank you for your, your um, expert insight. It's always a pleasure speaking with you and learning from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it really is touching to me when people will come and acknowledge it themselves. I really do want to help them. That's kind of along the theme of my book, Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety, is that the healthy function of anxiety is to stimulate preparation or change behaviors. So if someone's feeling nervous or uncomfortable about any part of themselves, I really encourage them instead of even just getting down on themselves about that part to welcome that awareness and say, okay, maybe that's a healthy signal that there's something here I need to work on. And then think about getting some techniques to help make the changes that they want. Great. Thank you again. I'll Thanks. see you soon. Great to be with you.